up. Yo, long hairs. Welcome to episode 110 of Let It Ride. Here we talk long hair and business, advocate for hair equality, and celebrate men's long manes with hair whips and high fives. If you're a guy with long hair, you're in the right place. I'm El Rubio. I am here at the Long Hairs Warehouse in the lounge with El Sicario and El Garvinsky and hailing from Cottonwood, California. Our returning guest on today's episode is the radical rider of BMX bicycles, a professional purveyor of bunny hops, big airs, and stalled out manuals. You may have seen him recently flying directly over mine and El, Mo- El Moreno's mains on Instagram. He's one of the big winners of our epic 2020 Community Hair Tie Design Contest and has been a loyal ambassador for the long hairs for nigh on three years. He's one of the most genuine and authentic men we know. He is the one, the only, Ready Matty! Yo, what's up, man? With the big intro. Nice. Look at that beauty. Beautiful bike. We're going to have to tell you, have you tell us a little bit more about that, but welcome back to Let It Ride. Thank you for having me. Pleasure Great. to be here. Great to have you here. So I looked back from our last time, our first blog post, and it was 2019 when I happened upon you at Adams Avenue Bicycles in San Diego. Since then, you've been on our podcast, part of several photo shoots, and you even designed the Bike Life Hair Ties for Guys. Woo! Things have changed, though. You're looking a little different from the last time we saw you. And late last year, you reached out to me with an earnest message. It was time for a reset. So tell us what was going on and what what has happened. Oh man, uh, yeah, you look just, great by the by you. the way. As thank a you. short hair, it I needs, gotta say it needs a little bit of a trim. But uh, yeah, I reached out to you because man, I was like legitimately losing hair, and I'd been diagnosed with Crohn's disease in July. Had no idea what was wow. going on. Um, things started feeling good, and with my recovery, I started gaining weight back. I lost a ton of weight, got really thin, and all this stuff. And during that time, I started to brush my hair after I would shampoo and condition and Mm. noticed that it was getting more and more thin, more and more product or hair was coming out in my hands. I was like, this is so nuts. So I reached out to you because I needed to donate it. And it was just time to restart. You know, my body had gone through some pretty serious stuff and I started feeling really good. Started coming back out of this darkness that kind of came at me and I was a little nervous to cut it off. Not going to lie. <laughs> I do. I do still miss it. Um, yeah. but it feels good. I feel, I feel good. You know, you have to kind of go through mm. some crazy moments in order to really appreciate stuff. So I'm appreciative that I'm still here. And if that needed to happen with hair loss, that's okay. Nice. Wow. Uh, so just take us through it a little bit more. You said, Crohn's disease. Yeah. And it was in July. Yeah. So it was oh, I'm probably breaking the microphones. I'm sorry. I move around a lot. That's just how it's going to be. <laughs> hey, get comfy. Yeah. I'm yeah. trying to get and stay comfy. Yeah. So yeah, just, uh, I mean, I guess you guys have already heard it, but I'll tell it to the listeners out there. Um, Please. I was just doing a full-time delivery coffee job local here to San Diego and started having, you know, a little TMI warning, started having diarrhea two days after I got my first vaccine dose. So I just assumed, oh, it's a vaccine immuno thing. Like my immune system just kind of needs to go through it. It's all All good. Well, two weeks after having consistent diarrhea, I got a little nervous. And then a month after I went to like a minute clinic at CVS, she listened to me with a little stethoscope, said, hey, if this is continuing, you should probably go get this checked out. This could be kind of serious. And it felt a little bit better, but man, I just had like weird gut feelings. And, you know, I really enjoy operating off of very little food. So that didn't help. I didn't have anything for my, for my body to be like running off of. And I figured I could do it. Oh, it's intermittent fasting. You know, everyone's doing intermittent fasting and I was doing it, but probably pretty severely incorrectly is what I'm guessing. Um, it got to a point where 
after two months, I started vomiting and having diarrhea at the same time. So I kind of just looked at myself in the mirror and was like, I have to go to the hospital. Like I legitimately felt like this is the stages of dying. And I was so thin. I'm about 200 pounds now. I was like 160 then. And it was, it didn't look right. You know, like I went from like the, the peak of my issues. I looked like, no offense to Pilates. I looked like a 70 year old Pilates instructor because my butt was gone. Like I didn't have a butt. It just kind of folded onto the hamstring. I didn't have my biker booty, like the voluptuous butt that we get from riding bikes. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like that's one thing. I really enjoy my assets and I enjoy my butt. So like, where did it go? And that really threw me for a loop. I could like, I'd hang my, my leg up and I could see my calf muscle in a weird way. Like it was thinner and all this stuff. So yeah, I went into the hospital, uh, got a camera shoved up my butt, uh, nicknamed colonoscopy, I guess is what they nickname it in there and severe ulcers in my transverse colon. So upwards of potentially two years was some of the most severe ones. And maybe the more recent ones, maybe six months at that point. So it was, uh, very scary. And when the doctor said you have Crohn's disease, I mean, in all reality, I just broke down and started crying because it's like, yeah, I immediately thought of my ego got destroyed. My hopes and dreams for riding bikes just went away. You know, I broke down right there and just lost it and was like, Oh sweet. I'm never going to be the same. I used to massage a client years ago, probably like almost over 10 years ago who had Crohn's disease and she was always in pain and it just, it devastated me. She was, she is, sorry, I don't mean to talk to her in the past tense. She's still alive and kicking, but she embodied such a joy based on the pain that she told me she experienced on a daily level. I mean, on an hourly level, even, you know, all of her joints, joint pain is a really big thing. And so that's just, I flashed her experience into my mind when I heard the diagnosis and it, yeah, it was devastating, you know, but. So what is, not everyone knows or it's not, not talked about often. What, tell us just what is Crohn's disease? So and how I don't have like an actual specific definition because I got really heavy into it and then I just gave up and was like, whatever. Basically, it's an autoimmune disease. Um, it's very similar to ulcerative colitis, which is UC. Those are pretty similar. UC, I, I want to say, is a little broader. It can happen all the way up to the esophagus down to the anus. And then Crohn's is a little more common in the colon region to like, I don't think it goes outside of the colon, but I think it's just more specific locale. And so since I had such a heavy dose of ulcers in the colon area, they were like, yeah, this is this is Crohn's. Crohn's is an autoimmune disease. Um, how I think it started the lack of food in my stomach and the amount of coffee that I was drinking, not saying that I was drinking absurd amounts of coffee, but I was pretty much only drinking coffee during the day, not really eating a lot of food, not the food at all. Yeah. And I was doing the bulletproof style coffee with coconut oil and grass fed butter and blending that up. And you know what? I kind of jumped on the gravy train of like, oh, I look good. I'm healthy. I'm fine. I just started doing dollops of that stuff. You know, the coconut oil and the butter taste so good. They're creamy when you blend it. Don't stir it. If you're going to try this at home, don't stir it with a spoon. You're a fool. You need a blender. It makes a frothy, beautiful head on the top of the coffee. Oh, it's amazing. I still drink it to this day. I just don't drink 30 ounces of it. I drink six ounces of it. You know what I mean? And I'm smart with my portions. But think about your stomach. I'm not a doctor, but think about your stomach and the stomach acids that are involved in digesting and breakdown. You need things in there in order for them to work. And when there's nothing in there for it to work, your stomach is churning and moving on itself. And over time, without any food in there, there could be an abrasive rub or some type of weird movement that your stomach lining is doing, and it cuts you. And then that cut sends a signal, hey, we have an injury, we need white blood cells, let's come down here and heal it. Well, the problem is, is you're still not continuing food intake, which is what I was doing, and I'm having acidic coffee. So I'm kind of just adding more problems to this little small problem that could have been shut down. Not to mention when you're not eating properly, your brain can just fire off on all sorts of emotional tangents. I'm a very overthinker. 
And I just, I live so much in my head. Like I'm, I'm really present at a lot of times, but I'm very distant in my thoughts and I am millions of miles away on my own conversational island, you know? So having that coupled with not eating properly and not having a good operating system, I think just slowly broke me down Mm -hmm. and being stressed out with driving in a city, people honking at you, cutting you off, trying to get over, they're not being nice. You know, all of these little road rage bursts of things, they add up in me. And I didn't know how to really deal with them. You know, I know how to exercise. I know how to lift weights when I'm pissed off and I know how to slow down and meditate and breathe. But there's so many more stresses that are involved in a day to day that you don't fully grasp. So it was a really big learning experience for me to realize that when I like that gut feeling, that's a real thing. You know, people, I mean, I'm getting chills. Think talking about it. People talk about the gut feeling. And when you really are intuitive with yourself, your body tells you things, you know, and I legitimately was telling my body to fuck off. Like, stop telling me you're hungry. I don't care. I have a job to do. I have to go ride my bike. I have to go walk my dog. Your little need for nourishment can go piss off. I need to do other things, you know, and I'd slam like a freaking gel of stuff, you know, or like a quick protein bar, but it wasn't substantial, you know, and it was so inconsistent with the level that I was operating at. So I basically learned that I don't think I was having enough caloric intake. That's where my stomach probably got a little abrasive hit, you know, and I have other things going on. There was another job opportunity. Those people were really cool at the start, um, ended up ghosting me. I'm not going to drop names because I'm not a gossiper, but that really sucks when you ghost people. If you don't have clear communication with people, you guys are doing everyone a disservice. So just clearly communicate and then, you know, save people from getting ulcers. <laughs> <laughs> How was your resting periods during that? How that was point? my resting period? Yeah. Like, did you have time for rest? Did you live in an extreme life? You would do. I mean, yeah, I, I say extreme life, but like, it was just, I made myself go do stuff. So, I mean, my rest is like, come home, maybe smoke a little bowl and, you know, just sit down and I'm constantly stretching or doing some type of exercise. So it was a lot of just like on the ground with my foam roller. And Mm. for the most part, I just wasn't listening to what my stomach, my colon ultimately was telling me was going on. And so rest time was like, okay, but it was not fully rest time. When I would sit and meditate, those were the most influential moments and the most beneficial ones because I would either sit up or I'd lay down and I'd put my hands directly over where I feel agitated, which was my stomach area. I mean, I don't know exactly where my colon is, but it's in your abdomen. And I would just breathe and think about like how happy I am that I have the dog that I have, you know, the life that I'm living, I'm still healthy. And my stomach would like, I'm like, do all these movements and make noises, which is part of the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. So I know I'm connecting with my gut and with my emotions and everything felt good. And then I just wander with my thoughts, you know, and then that would take me out of it. And so it, it was beneficial, but I was still not fully resting my mind. My mind was just going, you know. And I've also learned if you occasionally like smoke a sativa, sativas are uppers. And I really love being up, 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 up. And when I had sativa, I was like, oh my God, so this thought I have to do this and I could maybe do this, maybe I can do this tomorrow. And I'm like, dude, relax, (laughs) you know? So I learned a lot about that. I do like sober months and all that kind of stuff to really check in, see where my body is. Um, But the craziest thing was I felt so good when I was on my bike and that's really where I noticed that I think I have a problem because the moment that I get on my bike and start riding and it literally is life or death where like you don't pay attention, you get hit by a car or you fall off a jump or something. My stomach was fine. I didn't have any irritation, no agitation. And I vividly remember the last session I had, which was one week before I went into the ER and we were riding my buddy Sean's backyard jumps and he was like, I'm going to do the most laps I've ever done in my backyard today. And he's like, I'm going to aim for like 36. And I was like, dude, I'm going to do it with you. Every time we would come back up to the top of the ramp to where we drop in, I would stop and be like, Oh dude, I don't know what is going on. But my gut feels so weird. And then Sean would drop in and I'm like, all right. And I'd go and I wouldn't feel it. And then I'd feel it when I stop. And I just 
we, I did 40 laps that day. Like I was oh. exhausted. You know, we destroyed ourselves. It was awesome. And I, I took apart my bike when I got home because I was like, something's not right. Cause when I ride, I feel okay. And when I stop, I feel horrible. So I took apart my BMX and my road bike. So I wasn't tempted to ride them. So I could really try to get a better understanding with what's going on. We've written about this on our blog a number of times, but your hair is one of the first things that your body will stop producing yeah. at a normal rate. So you were, <clears throat> you were treated and you started recovering, but at that point, perhaps uh, your hair started thinning and it, so was, it, it was, was falling out even. Yeah. So it, it was, it was, well, I want to mention the, the food intake. It was limited, but the food that I eat, I don't eat fast food. I don't eat junk. You know, like I am very conscious of what I eat. A lot of people were like, but you're so healthy. And I'm like, trust me, I'm eating healthy stuff. I just wasn't eating enough of it. So that's what it came down to. But when I really started to, to notice the hair falling out was three months after my initial diagnosis, that's when I started gaining muscle back. I started filling out my clothes again. I started feeling good. I started getting like that savage feel again where I'd lift weights and be like, yes, it's here again, you know? And I was, uh, I was riding a little bit, but I noticed that when I'd put my hair in a bun, I got thick hair. When I put my hair in a bun, it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And maybe I was doing two wraps of the hair tie and not three or, or maybe three and not two. Like I had to, I could feel it, you know? And so I started looking things up. I started taking this medication called Stellara. It's a biologic. Um, the, my best description that I have for that is it is a medication that tells your body don't attack itself. It's okay. So if there's any issues in my gut where the white blood cells want to go mediate, the drug that I'm on, the medication that I'm on will say, it's okay. It's actually not happening. We're fine. And the Stellara is just meant to allow me to function without any issues. So I thought maybe as a side effect of the medication, you know, I had been on it for maybe one dose and it was like a higher dose than usual for the very first one to see if there's any reactions or whatnot. And that was when I noticed the hair loss would just take a shower, would brush it. And I saw it in the brush and I'm like, hmm, that seems a little excessive. And my, my scalp was kind of red and itchy. I think I remember messaging you about having like an itchy scalp and all yes. this. And so I've used, what was I using? Apple cider vinegar and water. That was something I heard was really good. So I was like using that to kind of soothe it and all this stuff, but it was still red and it was just not having fun. And I started to see it more. I started to see my scalp in a way that I didn't, that I hadn't seen before. And I have a hairdresser friend. I asked her, I had my hat on. I said, Hey, <laughs> does my hair look like it's thinning. I pull it off. She immediately knew immediately. It was like, yeah, you're, lo you're losing your hair. Hmm. And the doctors even told me, cause I would, me I would message with them and they said, well, hair loss is kind of one of the first things that stress will do to your body, you know? And you went the first two months where I didn't know what was going on. I went two months with diarrhea every single day. I mean, we're talking upwards of 20 times some days, oh, you know, I mean, and, and, and these are, these are not like unbelievable voluminous amounts. It was just, you go to the bathroom and it's just water coming out. Like someone cranks a faucet and stops and you're done. And then you go about your business. Oh, 40 minutes later, I got to go back to the bathroom, faucet on faucet off. Like that's how it was upwards of 20 times a day, you know? And the doctors were like, look, like you legitimately were malnourished. That's why your body was shrinking and dying. You probably had some pretty severe dehydration too. Yeah. And that was another thing. I was doing the liquid IV powders. Yeah. I was doing like three of those a day. I was drinking Pedialyte because I could feel the dehydration. Yeah. I actually noticed that things were a little different. I used to ride my road bike to work and back. It was only a six mile ride. And on the ride back, it, there was a small hill, but on the ride there, you just drop down the hills, no biggie. On the ride back, I started getting winded yeah. up that hill, which it, it did a little bit for me, but it was like the kind of winded where you get a little tired and then you're like, you ain't no little tired sissy, like, and you want to push more. <laughs> yeah. The One of the last times that I rode it, I was so exhausted and I got to the top and had to stop and like looked back at the hill and go, what is happening, dude? Yeah, like, like this shouldn't be this hard. This is so, am I falling apart? Like this, is, it was just too rough. So yeah, I told my hairdresser friend, 
please look at my hair. You're thinning, obviously. And then she goes, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want you to cut it. I got to cut it. You know, it's just, I'm not going to be that guy. No offense to, to that guy out there. I'm not going to be that guy that's holding on to the longest part of my hair when the volume is not there. Mm -hmm. If I'm thinning and it's bad, we're shaving this mofo and we're going to start from the ground, the ground floor, you yeah. know, the skull floor. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you brought up a good point of, uh, well, indirectly it, you were the, the, uh, there was a theme there of like your body was telling you like, Hey man, like this, something's wrong. Like, look, we're falling out. Uh, you can't do the same work you could yeah. before. Like those are all signals. I mean, this is an incredible machine that, that, uh, we as a species have like developed over so many, like hundred thousand years or more. Um, I mean, I'm not an anthropologist, forgive me. Right. But, um, hundred thousand is a little shy, but sure. it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> many, years. many millennia, millennia, yes. millennia. So, um, we have built in like warnings, right? Like, Hey, this hurts. Well, this one, man, that's not supposed to hurt like that. Yeah. Right. Like, or this has fallen out or, uh, you know, this or that's wrong. It's like, man, you got to listen to those signals. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, I hear uh, we hear it a lot, actually, like, oh, well, my hair has this thing going on. And then so, but then you start to like dissect like their lifestyle. And it's like, well, there you go, man. You don't drink any water exactly. or like and in, in your case, you had an actual medical condition. But but like for a lot of guys out there, it's like th there's just small little tweaks of like, d just be better to yourself. Yeah. You know, um, a, uh, a lot of people don't pay attention to their gut health. Yeah. Um, and like I, you know, I. I'm not the healthiest person in the world, right? Like I love a good cheeseburger. I'm a savage, but, um, I take my gut health very seriously. Yeah. Um, I'm, I love kombucha. Um, I eat a lot of pickled food. Yep. Um, I love coffee. I love coffee. Oh man. But I restrain myself, right? I, I limit myself. I can have two cups a day. That's it. Yeah. Minimum. Well, the first one is to get me going. The second one is all pleasure, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's hard because, we're not sitting here saying you need to limit your coffee intake. Mm, Everyone is right. so different with it. Yeah. And that's another difficult thing about Crohn's. Yeah. Everyone's experience is not the same. Right. You right. know, I looked on forums and um, actually one of the guys that rides for GT, Brian Kaczynski, he has UC ulcerative colitis. Um, not sure if he's like out about that. So sorry, Brian, if anybody hears that, but oh you boy. actually helped Brian actually helped me a lot talking to him because this dude drinks tons of coffee. And I'm like, yo, don't you have, you see, like, don't you have issues? Like, no, it doesn't bother me like that. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy buys like three large coffees every time he goes out, you know? And here I am like, can I get my cappuccino and like two ounces, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's so different. But what I like that you brought up also comes back. It's not an excuse, but it's just when you, when you're not paying attention to how things are running in your society, that's when you kind of get lost. And it was always pre COVID. It was always scary to call in sick to work. Nobody liked doing it. It was such a nerve wracking sensation, but if you didn't feel good, suck it up. You got to go to work. You got to make money. You got to clock in. And so there were so many times throughout my life in the past where I would just say, stop body, like stop telling me these things. I have to go do stuff, yeah. you know, cause this is more important, but realistically we've become so detached from the actual importance of having a healthy body and mm -hmm. listening to what feels good and what yeah. feels right. We've become so detached from that, that when those signals come up, we shut them down with a work schedule, yeah. you know? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And the the job that i was doing it was it was five days a week it was 7 a.m to like four every single day not until four usually it would be longer than that because it was crazy but it was the first time i'd ever worked a job specifically like that i've always been i wouldn't say an entrepreneur but i've always done a lot of different things so i've never had hey every day is this to this you know it's always a lot of things changing happening but that schedule for two solid years, which was weird to hear that the oldest ulcer was potentially two years old. <laughs> that, yeah, that timeline like hit me so specific. Um, it just made me really start to pay attention like, wow, okay, do I want to be in a position like this? Yeah, it was fun. Like I, I was the 
driver of the vehicle, I could park anywhere. I'd come to Ocean Beach and see you guys at the house. You know, like I'd stop by and say, what's up? Like it was amazing. I'd bring drop my off bike. Drop off some coffees. Yeah, drop off coffee. I'd bring my bike and ride on my lunch breaks and go to skate parks. You know, like it was amazing. I'd see my homies around town. Like it was so much fun. The freedom of that was great. The paycheck was great. The savings, love it. But realistically, I was just another part of, of the warehouse chain, you know, and I'm extremely replaceable. I don't think I am. But in that position, I am. And so it got to a point where after going to the hospital, after recovering, I didn't hear from anybody at that job. The only people I heard from were my supervisor and the owner who were just, when can you come back to work? You know, the owner was, a, I'll, 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 I'll give him this. He was a little more sensitive because he asked me, hey, how's your health? Since you say you can't come back to work, they expected me to come back to work two weeks after I got out of the hospital. Lose, lose 40, lose 25, 30 pounds, lose your muscle, get a hemorrhoid in your butthole because you, well, I mean, I don't know where else hemorrhoids develop, I don't know. <laughs> but you know, get, you know, go through all this stuff. I had a crazy hemorrhoid, which we'll get into that at some point, but it was so tender and sensitive. I couldn't sit like this, you know, and to like, just, just to bend over and have your hemorrhoid hit your boxer shorts. Like I was in crazy alarming pain. So I couldn't even walk my dog around the block, you know, for them to say like, can you come back after two weeks? It's like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, so at least he asked how I was feeling and I appreciated that. But bottom line, never heard from a single other person from that job. And I have their numbers in my phone. You know, I even reached out to one of the other guys who was a, another driver. And I said like, Hey, it was really awesome getting to hang out with you. He's a, he's an older cat. Uh, he probably shouldn't even be working there. He should probably be retired, but he has nothing else going on. But I was like, hey, man, it was really fun working alongside of you. I felt like you and I had a good camaraderie compared to everybody else type stuff. Just wanted to say, like, thank you so much for entertaining me. Dude didn't even write back, you know. Oh, wow. The next wow. time I saw him, he apologized for it. And I was like, well, hey, don't apologize. Just write back. Like, that, yeah. that's all it takes, you know. It's amazing how much just writing back to people will, like, help make things better. But I just realized that I'm a fucking nobody, you know, and it's okay. I've been, an, I've been a nobody my whole life, but there's, there's certain moments where you're like, really nobody, nobody cares at all. Mm -hmm. Like they had, they had people calling in, giving me compliments for how fun I am when I deliver or how good I was about making sure their order was right or the order was messed up. He went an extra step and brought it back when I wasn't clocked in with my truck, you know, like all these other things. And it's like, you don't want to just check in and say like hey i hope you're and, doing all right and, and it's like you it, it's almost like dehumanizing totally you know and there was and i and i didn't enjoy this because i don't like to believe that certain systems operate this way but there was a a warehouse worker and an office worker weird kind of headbutting vibe at that place you know and if i mean i was a warehouse worker so there were these moments where office workers were just kind of like mm, sticks up my ass and like screw you you know yeah. they were just bitchy and you're like, what is this? Yeah. We're supposed to like operate together. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of a mess there. It's a, it's a great company. I won't name names. If you know me, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I, I don't mean to talk bad about them in any way, shape or form. It's just a production yeah, line. You're, you're making an observation. Yeah. And, and, you know, and maybe if one of them hears this or whatever, maybe just check in with your workers. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. like it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. There was like weird drama back there and stuff and like I would I would call one of the dudes out the first like two months that I was there this guy would always give me a weird response I would like ask him like hey how do I do this because I'm still new and he'd be like you don't have to worry about that I'm like no dude I'm legitimately asking how I do this I would yeah. like to do it correctly oh don't worry about it. no one does it not what I'm getting at <laughs> and he was just kind of like a little bit of a dick and I straight up just called him out one day I was like look man you're the only guy I have issues with why what's going on yeah. why do, i don't want to have beef with you why do you always talk shit to me why do you always give me weird answers and just the fact that i called him out and we were able to man to man kind of feel awkward and talk about it mm -hmm. then we were cool then he told me about the new eminem album and i bought it and i fucking love eminem greatest <laughs> of all time you know <laughs> like <laughs> so that's, that's an interesting thing you brought up um uh just communication between men right and we have this uh through like shitty Hollywood and, and other stupid sources, we have this flawed perspective of how men should communicate. Right. And just the fact that you were, you were able to like reach out and just be like, Hey man, I don't know what it is 
between us, but like, let's squash that. Yeah. And whereas I feel like the, the, the method that's pushed on men is like, Oh, don't show weakness. Like, oh, what are you sensitive, bro? And it's yeah. like, yeah, maybe I am. Yeah. Like, I have feelings. Yeah, <laughs> I want to. I, I have to look at you every day, man. Right like, up. I don't want to have an issue. And you don't want to walk into a space or even park your car, ride your bike up, and then realize, oh, there's all these weird little moments about to happen. Yeah, all these weird little things, yeah. you know. And like, yeah. I'm 35 now. I realize it a little bit ago. I'm emotional. I'm sensitive. And I'm affected by stuff like that. Constantly. And I have yeah. no issues asking mm -hmm. until someone goes, stop fucking asking me, you know? Yeah. And, and it, it, it does make it a little difficult for me to have male relationships and male friendships because of, I pretty much, and I don't mean, everything is so specific with genders these days. I don't mean it in like a derogatory sense, but I communicate more like a female. I like to overly communicate. Mm. I don't mind asking 30, 40 questions. I don't mind if you go off on a tangent and tell me why you couldn't get back to me because you're emotionally unavailable, this happened, blah, blah, blah. Those, those help me. That stuff helps me paint a picture to where you're at in this conversation. And then I realize, oh, you're not mad at me. You're just mad because you didn't get a blowjob last night. <laughs> you haven't come for four weeks. Like I get it now, you know? It's not me. So. Sure. You're hundred percent right. There is a weird male to male, straight male, generally communication barrier. Yeah. You know, uh, this kind of touches on a conversation I had recently where, uh, like I personally, uh, to, to like you touched on, like, uh, I don't want to like gender stereotype. Right. So the way I think about that, cause I, I agree, like, I don't want to assign, uh, draw lines in the sand. Right. So I think of it as like, nobody yeah. is all you have masculinity and femininity, right? No one is all of one. No one is just masculine. No Very true. Regardless of what you identify as, no person can just, just be masculine or just be feminine. Every single person is a mix of both. Yeah. And because we are all on a spectrum of just humanity, uh, between there's three guys sitting here, and then we have uh, Garb over there. So there's four men right, right in this spot in this moment, and all four of us have the the slider of masculinity to femininity falls on some different yep. part of the spectrum right yeah and um so i don't i don't think it's even possible for someone to like and uh, well before we even get into that there's no such thing as like someone doesn't feel things yeah. right like <laughs> yeah sure, feeling nothing may, maybe if you're like a like a catatonic like psychopath and you yeah. eat people right like yeah maybe that but like uh but like when you said like you know I, I I'm gonna admit like I feel things right. To me, the difference between you and like a tough guy, the only difference is that you're willing to admit you feel things because yep. even the tough guys feel things too. Totally. They're just scared to say it. Totally. You know. And, and it's amazing how disarming mm -hmm. you can be to a tough guy yeah. by going up to him and be like, "Hey, man, I'm really sorry," or like, "I was feeling like this. I assumed the wrong thing." my bad and it and being vulnerable it's incredible how that helps every situation yeah you know it's yeah. really nice yep. yeah uh, a lot of people don't know i was actually a cop for two years and i worked for the san diego sheriff's office right that's and awesome <laughs> yeah i definitely did not know that <laughs> yeah and uh, one of the i mean man i got in a lot of scraps i can't even imagine sometimes they're just unavoidable man yeah. it's it was going to end up that way no matter what but um, and then you, then you had moments where it's like, I'm not a huge guy. I'm like six, two, but you know, I'm not a small guy either. And, yep. and sometimes you have these guys and they're just, they pick you, you yep. know, <laughs> Hey, we're throwing down. Like, yep. Okay. Yep. But, uh, I yeah, used to like, guy. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's like, I'm, I'm six, two, I'm six, two. And I feel tiny next to you. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got this, I got, I got, I'm full of big man. dude. It's just in my jeans. But, um, but, uh, I would use humor yeah. to, to disarm people yep. and to really de-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate situations. Um, cause like I, I learned, you know, if I can make you laugh, you don't, you probably don't want to punch me. You the know? quickest distance between two strangers is laughter. Yeah. And so I, like I would deal with these guys and they're all pissed off and, and then I'd be like, listen, man, I really don't want you to punch me in the face. Yeah. 
you know, like I didn't, I didn't come to work wanting to get punched today. And like, I would just keep like kind of, picking at them like in, my in, modeling in a, career is going to suffer if you punch yeah, me in the face right now yeah no and i would tell yeah. him like dude if if i come home with a black eye like i'm not getting laid like <laughs> dude, you know just, <laughs> i would just make up stuff and then they would just start laughing yeah. and then i'd be like all right man like what's the problem yeah like oh well uh, and it's like okay well why don't we just fix it yeah you know like we're gonna if we fight then we're gonna have to fix it after yeah but why don't we just skip the fight part yeah let's just fix it yeah. you know and then uh and that really helped me out a lot like yeah. just learning how to communicate with other guys in a way where there's not a confrontation and a lot of the time a lot of the times guys are already like hyped up and aggressive because they think you're gonna do that yeah Mm -hmm. and so they they feel they have to be prepared right Mm -hmm. so then if you come at them like well well hold on a second man like i don't appreciate when you say that to me like hey that kind of hurt my feelings like i i think you're cool yeah i want you to think i'm cool like you start throwing those things out there and they're like oh man like yeah like oh no one likes to punch someone who's saying they're sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not cool. Hurt my feelings. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I think that a, a lot of guys can really practice effective communication yeah. and just admitting like you feel things. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a kind of feels like a cliche, silly thing these days. I don't specifically do this cause I just speak my mind, but maybe take a journal and journal mm. some thoughts down that you've had of the day and of the, interactions that pissed you off. You know, yeah. I, I, I had uh, mentioned that I was maybe going to quit my job and do a different, it was going to be a different coffee job thing. And these guys were really good at, at the start, but then they fucking ghosted me. And I mean, that was, that was before I went into the hospital, but that was when I started having weird gut sensations because I was so emotionally committing myself to quitting my current job and jumping in full steam with a new coffee company who had never done coffee before. They had a really good backing as like a foundation, but I was nervous, but I was listening to myself and that's why I didn't fully jump. But the thing was, these fools ghosted me, you know? And to this day, I don't let that stuff go. I hold grudges. I know it's a bad thing, but I got to a certain point when I was healing coming out of the hospital where I have my old phone. This, the, the current phone that I have, that dude's number is not in my current phone. He's been deleted. He's been blocked. It's all whatever it is, you know? And my old phone still had his number in there. And I turn it on and go, like, I listen to music and stuff when I'm at home. And I just happen to see his number from our text conversations. And I'm like, oh, dang, you know what? Okay. So I, un- I unblocked that number and I sent him a text and I said, hey, man, I just wanted you to know it really hurt my feelings that you guys ghosted me. It would have been so awesome of you to just tell me to my face, we don't see this working out. I would have been understanding. I would have appreciated you for admitting that. And I would have, and I would have said, yeah, I agree because I'm feeling the same thing. It doesn't feel right, dude. Something's not cool here. But now that you've ghosted me, I mean, this guy's a, this guy's older guy. He's a solid dude. You know, like I want to go start shit with him. I want to go to his business and be like, yo, like what's up, dude. You remember me, but just, but so what I did was I just text him and just said, it hurt my feelings. You know, I actually do wish you guys the best, but bottom line, y'all suck and you're little sissies for not admitting something because we could have saved so much trouble, but you wanted to ghost me. So I hope you learn from this and I hope you're also laughing and showing everybody in the business how much of a little bitch I am because it doesn't bother me because I'm fine with being vulnerable and letting you know that you hurt my feelings Mm -hmm. and then sent, waited till I saw it said uh, like red and then I deleted his number again and was like, done, block, peace out, bitch. Yeah. Like, I just needed to get it off my chest. So if you guys got stuff that's brewing, write it down and then burn it and throw it away so no yeah. one ever sees it or something, you yeah, know? Get, get, you gotta get it out. Yeah. There's moments where so much time has gone by where that grudge isn't the same anymore and you can sit down and reevaluate emotionally how you feel about that situation. Mm-hmm. And it ebbs and flows and maybe you're creating a different story and all this stuff, but what can you learn from it, mm-hmm. you know? And at that, at that moment, I realized I was like, I wanna do something that makes me feel a little better as a person. And I wouldn't mind being around other people that have that same thought process, mm-hmm. you know? And unfortunately, I don't know if this is connected, but I just kind of think it is. I was, I was given this person's contact through a, from, from a friend. And now that friend and I have like zero communication because they worked with them 
too, you know, in a different, different capacity. And it, it got to the point where they would call me and say like, Hey man, they're talking about you. Like, are you asking a bunch of questions and like, do you know what I was like, yeah, are you kidding? I'm going to quit my job with benefits to go work for them. You're damn right. I'm asking them questions. I'm not blowing them up every day, expecting answers. I tell them, Hey man, I just had this thought. What, what do you think about an I-9 form? And they're like, what's an I-9 form? I'm like, oh my God, you want me to, want me to work for you? Don't even know what that is? Okay. So, you know, they, they stepped in and was like, hey, just want to let you know, fly on the wall. And I'm like, hey, I appreciate that. But it's none of your business how I run my business, how I operate for myself. They wanted me to do their social media. They wanted me to be a barista, all this stuff. I'm going to need to communicate with them. Sure. This is the step one of figuring out how well they communicate and they don't do it well. So I was already having my own reservations, you know, and you know, it's went the way that it went, but now that friend and my, and, and myself barely even see each other sure. when it was more consistent before, you know? So unfortunately I think it kind of got tied into that. Mm -hmm. And as far as like the pack thing goes, like I was involved in the pack when I was really, really young. And now I've been a lone wolf since, 15, 16, I've always kind of felt like kind of on my own, you know? For sure. Yeah, it's just, and, and not in like a, <laughs> I don't need anybody, I need people, but it's just, I don't need bullshit. Yeah, there's a saying for that too, I'm just full of these sayings. Yeah, no, I, I love it, uh, it's great. Don't be afraid to eat alone. Yeah. You know, because then you, you know what you bring to the table. 100%. You know? Mm. You know, like once you're like, hey, what's going on with this situation with our relationship? Like, yeah. what is it? There's no going back from asking mm -hmm. that question. So I've done that a few times. And then other times I'm just like, cool. I pull back mm. for my own, for my own mm -hmm. sanity, my own sake. Like sure. I keep my little distance there. Right on. But yeah, that's a, it's a good point. Yeah. I like, I like all the sayings. Sayings yeah, are good. Man, we, uh, <laughs> this is a house of learning hair doctors. So, uh, <laughs> It's we, good to have. We some stay sharp in here, man. Some, <laughs> no, it's uh, good. -liners. Yeah. So you came to decide to cut it off eventually. Yep. Uh, your health is back. You're, you're feeling stronger. You gained your weight back. Yep. I got to say, and the then hair some. is coming in thick. It feels so good. It's when a, did need, you need actually to... cut it? And did you immediately start growing it back, or did you wait for a little while? Or so trimmed it. I don't know if I know the specific date, probably mid November. It was right before Thanksgiving. So I trimmed it then, um, cried while I was getting cut, you know, just, it was like good tears though. It wasn't like sad tears. It was nice. I really love drastic change. I think it's really fun to do that kind of stuff. So it was a little cathartic and all that, but <clears throat> immediately my scalp felt so good. The next morning, it was like night and day different. My well, hair was trimmed. Still a it. How short? Did you shave it all off? No, 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 no. So pretty much how it is right now, just uh -huh. a little bit shorter and a little more groomed. But it was very long before. Very long. Yeah, it was almost like, down to your waist. Like yours. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, it was long. So you cut off two feet of hair. Yeah. Thinning hair, albeit, but yeah. So there was some uh, release there and some. Some goodbye yeah, I and picked some, up, some feelings. I picked up the hair, you know, and we like put it in. I don't think it's in braids. I think it's just kind of in its own little like four little ponies. And I just kind of held it and was just like, all right, this is super weird, but it felt great, you know. And then I let it grow out a little bit and then got it trimmed. And then I think let it grow out again and got it trimmed. Or maybe I'm in, I'm on the again part. So I think I've only had it trimmed maybe once since the initial cut. Okay. But it's, 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 it's due for it now. Like when I put on my, my hats, it kind of sticks out a little bit on the edges and I'm like, huh, kind of rocking this short hair thing. I don't really mind it. I just throw some water on it and it's all good. And it's, I don't have to worry about getting it caught in my armpit when I'm putting on sweatshirts or oh, yeah. dude, your bike or chain or in your sprocket or, or, yeah, or who knows? The bike, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it actually feels good. So. I'm not really sure where I want to go with it yet in the sense of I'm not, I'm not hating the short hair. I do miss the length, you know, but I'm kind of enjoying it. And so I'm enjoying looking at myself in the mirror and seeing a different version of myself today. Mm. I enjoy that. It's as much as I am like, fuck you. God damn it. <laughs> you bastard. You know, like, why'd you cut your fucking hair? Or like as much as I do that and I go back and forth with my own little issues, I do like to see progression. 
Right. And progression doesn't always have to be what you think is going to be the absolute best, but it may be the best for the moment, you know? And, you know, I gained more weight. Like I weighed 185 my whole life forever. Not my whole life. I didn't come out 185, but it basically, basically for like the last like 17 to 20 years, I've been 185. You couldn't, you couldn't force me to gain weight and you couldn't force me to lose it. It just didn't work. And now I weigh like 200, like, I feel so good. I'm eating, you know, I turned off one of my alarms so it wouldn't go off during the podcast, but like every three hours, a food alarm goes off. And I'm pretty up to it now where when I start feeling my stomach, it's within a five minute window of when that alarm goes off. So I'm very much more in tune with it now. It yeah. feels so good. If I wait 45 minutes to an hour after that initial sensation and maybe I'm riding so I have my alarm off, I start getting like bubble gut and like start like, oh, I need to eat right now, which I never had that in the past because I would suppress it. Uh, speaking of uh, your weight loss and then back to <coughs> getting back your weight again, uh, what's that like, you know, in your BMX life? You know, has that taken a change or? You know, not, not too much. Um, yeah, that's a good point because I, I'm always, I'm always fascinated by exercises and workouts and like right being buff like i've always wanted to be not as tall and lean i wanted to be shorter and more muscular my whole life i've always wanted that but realistically riding a bike there's only a certain deviation of size and voluptuousness in terms of your body that you can acquire in order to make bike riding easier or harder right. and i learned when i was back in humboldt this is when I was not stretching as much as I should. Uh, there's nothing going on in Humboldt. So I was working five days a week as a massage therapist. I was going to the gym five days a week and I was riding my bike three to five days a week. So I was go, 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 go. And I wasn't stretching enough. I wasn't getting body work. And my pecs were the first muscles that changed the most. They like started getting a little bigger. Yeah. I got some little like man boobs going on. And I started to lose my grip strength in my pinky and ring finger on my left hand. I do pull-ups at the gym and as I'm pulling up, my fingers would start coming off and I'd look down at them. I'm like, what the hell is this? And I would like try to close them and they weren't closing. My hand started blowing off on my grips when I would carve like a vert wall. They would just blow off at the bottom, just, just my left one. And so I went to an acupuncturist and she mentioned that all of the, all of the nerves for your your arms, your upper, your upper extremities, they come out of your cervical spine. So anywhere between, I want to say it's like C3 and maybe C5 are where they come out of. And they go into what's called a nerve plexus. It's kind of like a nerve intersection and it's underneath your armpit, like underneath your shoulder area. And so if you have, if you have a lot of muscle tissue, not a lot, I wasn't like bulging, but I had muscle tissue that wasn't being massaged it wasn't being soothed and it wasn't being relaxed. So the nerve conductivity between that, the nerve responses were getting shortened because it was a lot of pressure and not a lot of stretchiness and fluidity. And so the nerve signals to my ring finger and my pinky finger were not firing for the grip to hold on. And so she did a bunch of acupuncture points. I got massage, did it for about three weeks and my grip strength came back. And it was then that I realized I can't go be this buff ass lumberjack that I am trying to be and ride a bike. Cause not going to lie. I was throwing that bike around a lot easier, but I was suffering in the way of holding on to it. Mm -hmm. It was a weird thing. So I think if I, which I'm a little more privy to now, I'm really good at foam rolling, stretching, all that kind of stuff. So I'm at a pretty good spot where of course now that i've reached 200 pounds i'm like let's go to 210 <laughs> let's get let's get a little bigger you know like yeah like let's get beefy like i love that and if i'm around those types of people that's what's going to be my drive but then i'll go be around bmxers and i'm going to be like ah oh, damn my hammies are so tight like i can't do this right now so it's a it's a it's a nice balance but it hasn't really changed much you know so yeah it's been good right on yeah Landing a little heavier these days, I guess. <laughs> I saw a uh, video. I think you maybe posted it yesterday or last couple of days. And uh, you go over this rail and then you like land flat and you're like, Argh! yeah, and my <laughs> bars went forward. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah, I love just doing like weird little gaps and stuff. 
and there's this kicker ramp. They actually the same ramp uh, that I brought here to jump with you guys. Uh, okay, yeah. It's the same one. I had this this line in in mind, and it's at Claremont Skate Park. And where I set it up, I have to jump over this railing. But the downside is the 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 quarter pipe that I'm trying to jump into. It is so close to that railing. If it had another two feet of deck, it would have been no problem whatsoever. I would have given like an extra crank, and I would have been fine. But since it was so close, I had to jump over the rail, peak so I am over the rail, and then needed to drop immediately. And I started dropping my front end just a little too early. It was the very first go, and that's always like the most hairy. My hands are sweaty just thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And right as, I, right as I peeked over the rail, you hear me make a noise. I'm like, oh! And I was more front end heavy than I was back. If I knew I was gonna land flat, it would have been no problem, you know, but I didn't. And so right as I hit, my bars went so far forward. It's called Chicago style and ride them really far forward or like Corey Nastasio style bars. Shout out to Nasty. Um, and thankfully that happened because I didn't have over tightened stem bolts. If I had over tightened stem bolts, my bars might have broken or myself might have broken because I wasn't letting go. Like there was no question. So I think the weight kind of added to that. (laughs) But so you're landing really heavy here. I landed really heavy, mainly on the front end. I just mean in general, though, you're two, two hundred, max in two hundred. You're landing really heavy. How do you avoid your cranks busting or snapping? You got to have some really solid cranks on there. Yep. Profile racing, baby. They they make the best cranks ever. Um I just, I throw them through all kinds of stuff and they're fine. You know, even, even the plastic GT pedals were totally fine. You know, I mean, I didn't land necessarily down on them. Once I hit with the front tire and then went to my back tire, right as the initial front tire hit, I went so far forward that my feet blew off. So there wasn't really that much pressure on the cranks. I I would say it'd be more on the front tire and the forks and stuff. I just meant in general now riding at 200 pounds instead of yeah. uh, 190 in the past and giving you a chance to show off those beautiful profile three-piece cranks. Exactly. And uh, they're a sponsor of yours, is Absolutely. that right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And actually, Long-time sponsor. Yeah, they've been, they've been hooking me up for quite a few years now, and I would say it just became a little more official in, the, in, the, in, in maybe not last calendar year specifically, but in the last year or so has been a little more like, all right, Fully nice. team, sure. yeah. And awesome, that's, man. That's been. I mean, I have. I'm not, is this is this camera the one going going to me? I've got the profile Imperial Sprocket tattooed on my knee. Dude, Insane. a uh, true brand ambassador. The middle piece here is just like some mountains and like a little forest. Thank you, um, Sam, for tattooing this. I saw DMX the same night that I got my first BMX <laughs> tattoo. So <laughs> that was pretty sweet. I had a swollen ass leg at the end of that night. But, but yeah, man, that's my favorite sprocket. It's not the one I'm running right now. Um, it's the Profile Imperial. And yeah, that's my first ever BMX tattoo. And I'm, I love it. Badass, man. Hey, we'll get a little bit closer shot on the bike here. But can, can you just zoom in a little bit on this steed here? Tell us a little bit more about your bike. And are there any other sponsors featured on there? Yeah, so it's a GT Globetrotter frame. Thank you, GT, for supplying me with the beautiful frames you have. Dope. This one is in, I don't know specifically, like the trans red. And it's interesting. I was going through my mind wondering if I should say trans red out loud. It was just <laughs> like a like a trans loot. Trans loot? I, I, I mean, I, I don't know specifically what the color Translucent, is. Translucent? Yeah, because you, you can still see the welds, but there's like a sparkle to it. This red one right. is beautiful. I was riding... Yeah, it's like a candy. Yeah. I was riding the gold one for a little bit. It's more like a translucent kind of yellowish gold. Got it. And yeah, so GT profile. Um, I have a really cool little pad there for the nuts when you land on them, which in that (laughs) clip, I definitely, I definitely hit a little bit of the nuts. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Everyone's like, dude, how were the nuggets? I'm like, nah, they were way better than you think, but looking at it, it looked rough. Um, this is a really cool thing. One of the GT riders, his name is Dan Conway. He has a little signature snake skin with this company called the yeah. And that's his signature pad set. So I was like, dude, I got to buy one of those. Those are so sweet. And it works well with like the animal print theme that I have going on. But yeah, GT Profile, they're the, they're the main sponsors. And 
they're keeping me rolling. It's, it's been really good. I have a really good buddy, Philip at Odyssey that hooks me up. So thank you, Odyssey. And thank you, Philip. And thank you, Jeff Z, the team manager of GT and Matt Copeland, the team manager of profile. Just went out to Florida and saw him for Swamp Fest. Awesome, man. We'll link him up in the, uh, in the show notes. Uh, leading me to ask what is going on in the BMX circuit. You just were recently at Swamp Fest in Florida. Yes, sir. Cracking. It was insane. It rained a huge chunk of the time, which was very unfortunate. Oh boy. But those guys moved the majority of the ramps indoors. It was like an indoor setup that they had Sick. there. It was great. It was so much fun. Um, my personal experience there, I was a little frustrated because I had just found out three days before flying there that I had a cracked head tube, which is the top part of the frame, the small little tube in the very front. There's the top tube, which is like where your balls would hit if you were to crotch it. And then there's the, the down tube or the bottom tube. So on the welds of the head tube, there were cracks from repeated uh, landing like I did in that clip, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you do so many roof drops and so many big gaps and you come up a little sketchy a few times, like there's only so much abuse it can take. So unfortunately, but fortunately, I had to get a new frame and I built it up while I was out in Florida. So anybody that rides knows that building a new bike is awesome and at the same time, it's terrifying because now you have a whole new setup. Nothing feels the exact same. And I went and rode a bunch so of sketchy weird. ramps. So it was like, oh gosh, it was so crazy. But it worked out to be a, such an such a awesome time. It was super fun. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. And what else? Any more competitions? Uh, you're just out, you're riding for fun, doing your stuff on yeah, a pretty regular mainly, basis. Mainly ride for fun. Um, GT has a video coming out called SIFT. It's C-Y-F-T, can you film this? And it's like a full length, team video that people have been working on for years. And so when I jumped on the team, I was able to start working on this too. And just got wind like, gosh, last Friday that the video is completed. We just have to, you know, take a little more time. We're gonna, they're gonna do some video premieres and all this stuff. So it's gonna take a little bit more until it comes out. But doing, doing little videos like that, um, I'm hoping to go back to France next month and that would be amazing. There's a really cool company out there called Unicorn and they're putting on the second annual shorts and socks contest. And I went to the first one, it was awesome. And yeah, man, it's gonna be great to see my buddy Tama, who got released from prison. Tama, if you hear this, I love you. Cannot wait to see you. That's a whole nother can of worms we can get into. Congratulations, yeah, we're familiar with it, man. Yeah, so thank goodness for That's the good news. judicial system and things working out in the favor of innocent people. Nice. It'll so be I good can't to wait reunite. to see him. That's the whole reason I really want to go to France to see him and to add a little bit of a jam contest thing on top of that, which he'll be one of the MCs there. That's just even better. Awesome, man. Yeah. Loving it. Still pedaling. Still pedaling. No plans of slowing down. You know, I take care of myself as much as I can, you know, working for the YMCA now, getting to teach little kids BMX lessons and you know, it's been, you know, that's the job I ended up going into because Gary Young is the di director there. Thank you, Gary Young, for just being Gary. Gary's been in the scene for 30 something years. And, you know, he's been a pro pretty much throughout, like, the whole time. He's from San Diego. And now that he's the director there, I was like, can I come work with you? So it's been great to be around him. One thing I was thinking about, especially when I watched you just freaking send it you know, hopefully not killing my two bosses. Right. <laughs> I knew I've never doubted you for a second, but like when people watch stunts, they, they, they're not, they're watching you do it, but then they're really envisioning themselves doing it. Yeah. And that's where the awe comes from of like, Oh my God, I could never do that. Right. Yeah. And so, um, one way that I, when I watch your videos, I feel like, uh, as entertaining as it is to watch, it parallels the long hair message is like confidence. Yeah. And I see you like doing these crazy stunts or tricks or whatever, what have you. And I think like, man, the confidence it takes to do it and not like, oh, I'm pretty sure it'll work out. But like, I know it's going to I know I can stick this, you know, blind faith. Yeah. <laughs> but but like even so, you you have the confidence of like to just go for it. And I think that that's something that that. uh that uh, we can parallel to guys 
that like they want the long hair or they have the long hair and they're trying to keep it and stand up to the Y for the girlfriend or uh, Or R.I.P. Chuck's hair. Normal Um, society. Yeah. 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 And so I think there's a message in there of like you just got to You just got to not just necessarily just go head first. I mean, haha, long hair, right? Head first. (laughs) But uh, there's a message about confidence in there. Like you got to believe in yourself, man. And like we get messages about guys saying like, oh, you know, I kind of have male pattern baldness or I don't know, my hair is very greasy or like uh, a very close friend of mine, he has really coarse hair. And there's always these things of like, you can tell it's hurting their confidence. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, how do we, how do we build like, like a, especially now as you're, you're taking more of like an instructor role as well. Like, how do you, what, what do you communicate to these people to like help build their confidence? I just let them identify what they enjoy uh-huh. and build off of that. You know, I just taught a lesson to a kid yesterday and he was struggling a little bit. You know, he crashed a few times and I could sense that he wasn't fully there Mm -hmm. and wasn't really wanting to do it. And so what I actually did was I had him work on some manuals, which manuals when you're starting out are horrendous. Mm -hmm. They piss you off so much. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see how he was going to operate in that world of frustration. And, you know, he was screaming, getting pissed off and all this stuff. But what I ended up asking them after we were done, I said, hey, you ever stick your head out your dad's window when, when, he's, when he's driving and you see things that you want to ride? And he's like, yeah. And I go, don't ever lose that. We see things in a different way than other people see the world. Mm-hmm. We see things in ways that we can potentially have fun on. Don't ever forget that we're having fun. Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted him to realize, even though he's frustrated at certain points, we do enjoy riding bikes, mm-hmm. you know? And that's actually a little mantra that I tell myself. Um, I don't tell myself it every single time, but I do when I put in a lot of runs at a spot. If I'm like doing something over and over and over, I get frustrated and I don't ever want to be that guy who's like, "Ah, let's just fucking do it now. Hit record. Let's go. I never want that. Mm. That doesn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. Even though I feel it a little bit, what I'll tell myself, I mean, people have heard me say it out loud as I'm riding up to the, the takeoff or whatever. I say, I love BMX. I love my bike. I love riding. Like I say it as loud as I possibly can. And that's why I kiss all the spots that I do crazy shit on. I kiss my bike. I have a little dog paw sticker on Saw my that. tube. Yeah. And whenever I'm about to really send myself, I will, I will kiss it. And I think about coming back to Roxy and I kind of tell, I either say it out loud or say it to myself, like, I'm going to come home to you. Like, I'll be able to walk you tonight, you know? And I think about her for just a moment, which helps take the frustration or the fear and set it aside for a moment and realize there's a larger purpose for my existence, Mm -hmm. which kind of helps to increase the confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, Do we still have a little time to keep going? Yes, absolutely. I was actually going to say that I have to run upstairs to sign a multi-trillion dollar contract (laughs) but i would love to continue on here maddie and can you be sure to let our team know where they could follow you connect with you after the show absolutely and i'll let the boys here take it to the finish line as always pleasure having you here man you're a fine man You're you're a great influence and uh example for everyone in our community i think we learn a lot from this show and thanks for being on with us man thank you for having me all right you guys, you guys uh, got it under control here. We got sure. this. We got this. Um, I started to lose a lot of confidence after diagnosis, after being so frail, you know, and four months after diagnosis, I had an opportunity to go to Louisville, Kentucky with GT to go to this indoor park, ride a new indoor park there and ride some street and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And we go there. I was really, it was my first time like legitimately riding and we go there everything's fun we go out to ride street and we go to this one famous spot in kentucky louisville and it's like a it's kind of like a dam type of setup like a water dam thing and it has like this really cool interesting spillway the bottom has this nice little transition but up top there's a very large ledge and i wasn't really looking at it at first but dan conway the guy who i said with the snakeskin thing he was like yo ratty that's got your name written all over it. You do one of your little like thingy things and jump around, spin around. And I'm like, oh my God, that's massive, dude. Are you, he's like, you got that all day, dude. And I'm like, all right, well, I never take my bike up 
on to, onto something unless I'm going to do it. I will always get myself up first and then I go through all the motions. I stand up there, I close my eyes, I do all the turns, all the little pivots, the things that I think I'm gonna have to go through. And it started to feel like it's possible, you know? And I'm like, all right, I think, I, I think I'm ready for this. And this is the first time I've really sent myself since the diagnosis, so I was terrified. And one of my good friends who was there, who was, who was helping us film, he has filmed the majority of my clips in the most recent edit that I had. And he has accredited me with like being super quick. And he's like, Maddie knows what he wants. Like he goes up on a roof and he's off in 45 seconds. Like he knows what he's capable of. And when I told him I'm ready to go from start, from telling him I'm, I'm good and me climbing up and me being done and doing it, it was eight minutes. And that threw me a little crazy because I was up there and I had a little bit of a sore, sh um, sore shoulder. I was just like, like bunny hopping, kind of sitting a little twinge of pain, just a tiny, the, the smallest little twinge. And I was nervous that if right when I hopped to stall my tire, I'd feel that little pain and it would throw me, it would mentally check me out of what I was doing. So I was super nervous about that. And there's also, I'm doing a brake trick, so I'm nervous about my brakes not grabbing, so I'm like rubbing them with sweat and all these little things. But I went through an emotional roller coaster up on that ledge. Mm. I was yelling like, ah, like getting so loud. And I started getting teary eyed and like a little crying, you know, like I was going through all these emotions because now I've been faced with the fact that I'm not invincible. Mm. And it freaked me out because before I would have just sent it, you know? Yeah. And then of course, first try, pull it, no big deal. And I actually started crying afterwards. I rolled up to the dudes and everyone gave me high fives. Like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, I'm good. I just need to cry. And these are happy tears. And I just like, there's a picture of me like holding like this and I am just crying and it feels so good. Like it felt so good because that confidence got shook. Yeah. You know, the confidence for sure got shook, but I was able to still keep it maintained. It was really, really nice to be able to still have it. Right on. Yeah. That's amazing, man. Uh, I really liked what, when you touched on, uh, doesn't matter if I'm not like getting it right or what, like so this, this thing I'm trying to do, the fact that I'm able to do it, like the fact that you can still ride, yeah. just, just even then, even if you're not nailing it, but you're just able to go and try, yeah. makes you appreciate it. And so, uh, you know, initially we were talking about confidence and with the hair and how that can parallel with your confidence on the bike. And I was thinking like, well, some guys like my best friend, for example, don't really love their hair, like the way it looks, but, and, and they found that out by growing it out. And so like, you know, my friend is, is uh, a little self-conscious about his hair, but I, I tried telling him like, dude, but you have long hair, right? So even if it doesn't look exactly perfect and it's not the way you envisioned it, you're able to do it. Yeah. But the fact is you have the long hair. Right. Yeah. And appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's a gift. Dude. Yeah. And that you was, know? that's, that's exactly what it came down to for me was, you know, I'm up on that ledge and I just thought, dude, four months ago, you were so underweight, just got diagnosed with a thing that you thought was going to ruin your riding career. Mm. You are now on a ledge in Louisville, Kentucky, with the GT team mm -hmm. and you're about to send it. Yeah. And this is the biggest move you've done since diagnosis, mm -hmm. you know, and just being able to be in that spot, I was happy mm. and I was proud. And even if I would have crashed and didn't hurt myself that bad, I would have been okay with it. Mm. You know, I was even at the point where I'm on the wall and I said, can we, can we maybe come back tomorrow? Like, are we going to have time to come back tomorrow? And they're like, I mean, I guess, but you're up there now. And I'm yeah. like, you're so right. Like I'm right yeah. here. Like, yeah, damn yeah. it. And it rained all day the next day. So it was like, it was perfect, you know? And another thing with like listening to yourself, you know, there's, there's a, there's a moment where some BMXers have pulled so many things, so many tricks in so many different ways that they just assume it's going to be fine, mm -hmm. you know, and false confidence yeah. can, can help to a, a larger, to a large degree but it, it won't get you through everything, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's okay to fake it till you make it, but there has to be a really strong part of you 
that is yeah. very focused. Yeah. You know, and so that, I think that was why it took eight minutes because I was teetering. Hmm. I was teetering so hard on that line of like, no, dude, don't do this. You're going to hurt yourself. It's going to be a shitty time flying back on the plane with like a bum, whatever. This is going to be fucked up. This is, your brakes are going to slip, you know? And I was just like, stop with the voices. Like, and that's yeah. where I think the audible, ah, like, oh, yeah. and I was like shaking my hands out because I could just, I could feel it building up in me. So I want to touch upon that. You know, yeah. when we filmed uh, last year. Yeah. And one of the things that when you're on a bike or a skateboard or any type of tool out there, creativity comes about. Yeah. And one of the things I liked about when we were filming together for the long hairs is that the way you saw difficulty was you, you didn't stop there. You know, like you would kind of think like, well, what else could we do? Like, wait, hold on, hold on. There's got to be another way. Yeah. And so with that, I want to correlate that with the hair stuff. You know, a lot of people might be stuck at a certain point, but you could find, you know, through creativity and what is your authenticity, you know, not being fake, you know, like what can you find that works for you? Yeah. So shout yeah. out to you and yeah. all those guys are doing stuff yeah. that yeah. are tough, like in Louisville. Yeah. Yeah. Side note that, that day that we shot where you were, you were like, uh, you jumped and then you like bounced off the fence. Uh, the fence. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first day I ever met the team. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was my introduction. That's right. To, that oh, was yeah. my wow, introduction sweet. to long hairs. Yeah. That's rad. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm in a bike shop and he says, Hey, you got a nice mane. And I was like, thanks, dude. That's a little weird, but all right, yeah. whatever. You and then your long hair. Yeah. And then I, and then I realized I was, I was like, well, it's not that nice. Like I, it's kind of dirty. And like, I started being a little sensitive about yeah. it. And he's like, no, man, I, I, I had this, I had this company, blah, blah, blah. And he gave me hair tie, you know? And that was the initial thing where that's not generally a thing you would say to another man. Hmm. Men don't really dish out comments or then like, hey, how's it going? Like, you're looking big. It's like, all right, cool. But you're not like, dude, your hair looks great. Like, guys yeah. don't usually say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it, that's one of the things that set you all kind of aside was you guys are caring about a thing that every man has, but, des but maybe not necessarily wants to speak about it. I or like to put it on record that we all here like to break stereotypes. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. We don't straight on the stereotypes here. Straight um, up. The one thing that I, uh, I've i recently been educated on is um, just learn to accept praise. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Uh, I think as men, we're expected to like be performatively humble is how I call it. Yeah. Where it's like, hey, man, you got great hair. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't washed it. It's like, yeah. listen, it doesn't matter. It looks good right now. And yeah. the guy's giving you a compliment. But hey, thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Um, so, and then one, uh, this is something I told a friend recently because um, they have a really hard time with praise. And I said, okay, maybe you don't think that way of yourself that you have the nice this or that or, or you're great at whatever your skill is. I said, do you respect me? Well, yeah, of course. So then you respect my opinions, right? And my opinion of you is of high praise. So even if you're in initially not willing to think of yourself highly like that, you can at least respect me enough to accept this praise I'm do. giving you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to spin it. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Man, we're just we 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 uh we have a we have a meeting actually every Tuesday, and uh we always try to have like an exercise, a team exercise of, you know, just thinking outside the box and and um. One of the reasons I love being on this team is like uh, you can't work here and not constantly seek to better yourself. Yeah. Just like personal development, developing our masculinity. That's part of our core vision and at the long hairs. Um, and so just little things like that, like like uh, yep. even I've gotten better at, at, at receiving compliments and um, taking credit for stuff that I like ideas that I have. Uh, this is something I talked about with uh, Elefante recently where. I'll have like a great idea or I think it's a great idea, but like I'm not confident enough or, or I'm too hypercritical of myself to just do the thing 
and then take the credit for not to like overly take the credit, but to accept the credit yeah. for it. Yeah. So I'll seek to like pull someone in and be like, here, do this with me. <laughs> that way when, when the praise comes, it's like, well, it was both of us. Yeah. When in reality I planned this shit like two months ago. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you just want to share the resources, man. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm a feast mindset guy, yeah. but also at, to a fault sometimes where like, I don't want the praise yeah. or I'm like embarrassed that, I had a good idea and you you know you nailed that it happens all the time yeah I, it, everybody i think a lot of guys just do it two days ago i gave this guy praise for he had like the flyest outfit in the whole space you know it was like this i don't even know what it really was but it top and bottom bottoms were pants top was like a sweater thing and it, they were both the same color both the same it looked like a tracksuit type thing you know and I walk up to him and I was like, yo, dude, you got the best outfit in this whole space. And he's like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> and, like, and I'm like, no, you do. I know. That looks good. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah, walked yeah. away and I realized, you know, now that you're saying this, I realized I'm like, dude, I do the same thing. I try to just like not accept. Mm -hmm. But then there's other times where I'm like, thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, so I, even just learning how to say thank you. Yeah. You know, and like, of course, you're a person with good manners. You do say thank you, but saying thank you when it really matters, yeah. not just as a reflex, like someone handed me my order. Yeah. Like okay. generally being in the moment. Yeah, yeah. Actually Feeling thanking that. them for the, the thing. The exchange. Yeah. You yeah. know, so like I, I practice that too. I like to practice. I learned this from my wife, actually, where she'll, she'll constantly compliment other women that she sees, like for their hair or their outfit or, or, you know, this thing that they just, this work they just did. And, um, so I'll see guys and I'll be like, dude, that's a sick hat. Just little, yeah. little stuff like that. Hey bro, those are sick dreads. Yeah. Oh man. Thanks. You know, like, and, and it's funny how a lot of guys are like caught off guard. Yeah. Like they weren't like, Oh, what? Absolutely. Like you like that? Yeah. Robotic yeah. face. Yeah. And it's like, of course, bro, it's sick. Like yeah. you obviously put a lot of effort into that. Yeah. Like, right. They you just, know? they don't want it to seem like they put a lot of effort into it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, speaking of, you know, now that your hair is growing back out, you know, do you think you'll be growing back out to donate one day? I mean, I'm going to donate hair for the rest of my life now. Like, yeah, if it gets to a point where I can cut it and donate, yeah. why would I not? I think back to all the haircuts that I had yeah. before. I would go in these kind of like eight year bouts where I would cut it and then grow it out, cut it, grow it out. And the last one was before I moved down here mm. and I chopped it off and then ended up going to Vietnam for like two months. And mm. it was like, Man, I could have right. donated that hair. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, what? So, so is it safe to say you'll be joining us in 2024 for the Great Cut? I believe so. Um, hopefully, I'll have enough. I don't know if I'm going to start growing it out right now. I think I'm going to get it trimmed uh -huh. and still keep no you pressure. Know, still keep it, but yeah. for sure, any any time that I do a decent cut of hair now is going to be right donation. On. 2024, man. Minimum donation. Yeah, minimum donation is eight inches. Okay. Uh, ideally, they want twelve. Okay. Um, but uh, the great cut, I was not present for the last one, but um, the great cut, correct me if I'm wrong, is has, you know, performances, singers. I think the Shocker oh, sweet. did Magic yeah. last time. That's right. Oh, okay. So that'd be sick if there was a BMX show. Dude. You know? And I, and I Bring know all the homies. BMXers. Bring uh, the shout out to Joss, too. If, if it weren't for you, we, you know, Joss is now. That like would be crew rad. Now. That'd be Long pretty hairs. badass. Yeah. Just standing in line waiting to get your hair cut and you see some cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, dude. That'd some cool so stuff sweet. happening. Yeah. We could jump over the barber chair. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, see? Creativity and authenticity, guys. It's a core value here. Hell yeah. This that would be it. great. How are we doing on time? We're doing pretty good, but I think. Uh, you got any more questions? You got anything else? No, we should end it strong, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so good. I like to. I like to send a uh, some sort of message to people watching, just a takeaway. I know there's a lot of takeaways in this one, yeah. But like, uh, I mean, you just came, you just got through, not just, but you recently got through a very trying time. A lot of scary, like your health, yep. your identity is at risk here. Yep. You know, so how if so? There's obviously someone out there also dealing with a similar situation, and how would you get them through that? I would say really trust your instincts okay. and try to listen to yourself more. Nice. And it does not hurt to ask questions. You know, I was very embarrassed about the fact that I couldn't control my bowels to a mm -hmm. certain level. Yeah. And I had mentioned it to a couple people in confidence and before it was on a different podcast and was out about it. And I had messages from people that they knew and they basically were like, go get yourself some Depends diapers. And I was like, just did. Like already purchased yeah. and I'm embarrassed to admit it. But at that stage, 
I needed it, mm -hmm. you know, and the person who I was riding with, they needed it too. They had already gone through it. Yeah. They said average about three and a half months is how long it took them to fully recover. And they were like, I shit my bed. I shit my pants. I shit in everything that I owned. And I got tired of that. So I bought diapers for a small window of time. Things started to heal. The inflammation went down. Everything was okay. Now they're good. And then they donated the rest mm. of the, of the diapers to like a senior home, you know, and that's right what on. I ended up doing. I didn't, I didn't post this cause I was like, eh, whatever. But I have a, a little video of myself riding with a backpack full of depends diapers and I'm riding my way to a senior center to go donate the rest of them. That's beautiful, and I'm man. so grateful that I'm donating them because I don't need them anymore. Right. And I want to give them to someone who mm -hmm. can instead of just throwing them away. Yeah. So, so definitely, you know, don't be afraid. Just humble yourself. Hey, look, you're, this is obviously not a place you want to be in, but yeah. the, don't be afraid to just ask and try to communicate, mm. you know, and, and, and don't be afraid of what your instincts might be screaming at you. Mm. Even though it sucks to hear it, I don't know who you got to talk to. Talk to your best friend, call up a better help therapist or something, you know, try to find someone to talk to, but just listen to yourself. And if you don't understand it, ask people, communicate with people. Mm. You'll be blown away by how receptive people are by your vulnerability. Sure. I'm wondering if yeah, the, that's big, man. I'm wondering if depends one. would be open to a sponsorship. I mean, BMX. <laughs> yeah. BMX <laughs> hopefully, you know? hopefully so. not. Uh, yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe for like the old guys of BMX. After, <laughs> after you've lost all your control, yeah, you know. I know they wanted me to give the give the handles out or whatever. My yeah. Instagram. Um, Where can they find you? It's R A T T Y Ratty, and then M A T Y Matty. One T and Matty. It's weirdly specific, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, reach out to there, type that in. You can find me on most everything, not on TikTok. I dropped off a of TikTok, but who knows? Maybe I'll be back one of these days. TikTok, don't stop. You put out a video not long ago. Where can people watch that? Oh, oh, the No Bad Thoughts edit. Yes. Yeah, so that's on the Our BMX YouTube. If you just type in Ratty Matty No Bad Thoughts, it'll pop up on YouTube. Okay. We'll make sure the link goes on to right? Yeah, You'll be able to see it. If you haven't watched this video, it is so sick. And also your palms and will be sweaty. Uh, your minors, booty hole is going to pucker. Mine are sweating again. Dude, just thinking about that it. video. Damn. Like, and yeah. And, and that was one of the things I was really grateful for was in certain edits, you, you can kind of just film forever. Yeah. You know, there wasn't like a specific concept in mind or anything like that. It was like, let's just do big stuff. And we were still actively filming. Mm -hmm. The day that I went to the hospital, I saw him and he was like, he called me. He's like, yo, I see your van. What's up, dude? Like, hey, you want to ride this weekend? And I'm like, honestly, I feel super weird. So I don't know if I'm going to be riding. Let me yeah. just touch base with you. And sure enough, ended up going to the hospital, having that issue. And I told him, I said, hey, I don't know when I'm going to be able to ride again. And he was like, you want me to wrap the edit up? And I go, yes, please. Yeah. So we had other plans to do other things, but it just, it worked out how it was. And he popped that thing out super fast after my diagnosis. I think it went out in like a month after I was diagnosed. So I was super grateful for him for busting his butt. Yeah. My Ryan Fudger, thank you so much. My favorite part of that was when you, you were on a roof and then you spun and then you landed and you missed this post that by post. like a millimeter. Yeah, I actually didn't miss it once. I hit it every single time. Really? Yeah, every single time I hit it. But people don't realize where I hit it. I hit, uh, it, I hit it with the right side of my pedal. Uh, so like if my feet are on my pedals, like this is, this is my pedal. I'm assuming uh -huh. that camera's on me. Sure. This is my pedal. My feet are like here. So there's a little bit of the platform mm -hmm. that kind of hangs out. Uh -huh. And this, the hard part of that maneuver so essentially what it is, was I started on both tires, the, the roof itself, three inches wide, like the Yikes. edge that I had to be on. It was a single ply roof. So it was a three inch wide thing. And then had like a little tiny embankment down mm -hmm. to the actual part of the roof. Yeah. So I had to balance myself, get my cranks ready. And then right as I put my foot on, I'm ready to do it. But I do this really big yank. Mm -hmm. So I always yank too much. Mm -hmm. And when I'm that high up, I end up traveling a lot more than I'm going to realize. So the first one, if you, if you watch the video, the first one, I laugh because I'm like shocked that I didn't hit the pole. But as I'm coming around and looking down, all I see is the pole in my sight. Yeah. I'm like, I'm hitting the pole. Yeah. I'm hitting the pole. 
And thankfully I missed it. My elbow could have smashed it. Or but you I, could have pulverized like your femur or something. Yeah, <laughs> but I, 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 bent, I bent one of the pedals uh-huh. and then um, ended up putting on different pedals and pulling it. So wow. like it was to the point where yeah. it wasn't pulled perfectly, but Gary Young was there and I was like, Gary, what do you think? And he was like, you rode away. Like you did it and I kind of think that's a little crazier because it shows how wild that is. Yeah. It's different when someone pulls everything perfect. Mm-hmm. And so what I ended up having to do was I had to scoot back on the roof closer to, if you look down on my right side, there's one of the poles mm. and the pole that's next to it. That's the one I'm constantly bumping into. So I had to back up more and it was such a mental game to be standing up there, looking down, knowing that it looks like if I do it now, I'm going to skewer myself, but right. knowing that the distance I'm going to travel, if I just keep doing the same movements right. will put me in the right space. And that's that confidence. And that was, and it took me seven tries. Damn, I did that. Dude. I did that six oh, times I'm and scared. then ended up pulling it. <laughs> you guys are not the only ones that are going to watch this. I got to watch this. It sounds so gnarly. Yeah, go check it out, please. No bad thoughts, right? No bad thoughts. Yeah, and on right. that note, this is a perfect landing as well. We thank you guys for joining us and uh, we'll see you guys next time. See you. See you.